can we do anything yeah. and uh, let me just uh, go live on that so good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, welcome to another session of uh, thoracic gurus today is my privilege to introduce a thoracic mahaguru really not just a guru but a mahaguru he is the guy who has uh, really made a difference to thoracic surgery in india he is the senior most thoracic surgeon ex president of uh, the indian association of cardiothoracic surgery and the ascvts he 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 i i love his enthusiasm for teaching and more importantly i love his enthusiasm for learning uh, even uh, at at an advanced age of life he decided to learn vats and then uh, you know looked into uniportal vats and things like that he's always uh, you know available for new ideas and and that's the beauty of uh, professor rajan santosham uh, dr santosham has probably one of the largest experience uh, in the globe in tracheal surgery and we are very fortunate to have him with us today uh, professor santosham the floor is all yours uh, please tell us all about uh, tracheal surgery may i request everybody to please switch off your microphones and please do not scribble on the screen because we get lines on the screen so don't do that sir take it away thank you zamir for the nice kind words i'm very very happy that zamir is taking so much of interest in the teaching program and doing so many live sessions every day and as you all know he has been a very very busy surgeon and has traveled all over the world and taught so many people i have learned a lot from him regarding uh, the thoracic surgery minimally invasive surgery then i realized at one point of time that that is not for me and we needs a younger blood to do back surgery more effectively and uh, i still do a lot of open surgery but the video assisted surgery rajiv is doing is exclusively i'd like to say a few words about me i started developing an interest in thoracic surgery because my father was a tb specialist who had a tb sanatorium and a chest hospital run by me my brothers and our children i uh, i was also teaching thoracic surgery many of you may not know in the madras medical college where i joined in 1964 and retired as a professor and head of department in cardiothoracic surgery in 2005 41 years in india in tamil nadu nobody can serve the government for more time than 41 years then of course at the santosham chest hospital apollo hospital has been very good to me right from the time i started and the cancer institute at ai uh, thoracic surgery has been i've done about 500 cases the results have progressively improved every case has been a new learning experience progressively i have modified my technique to improve results attended all tracheal update meetings in vienna and other places of the world to improve my technique and took personal advice from rilo when i started uh, tracheal surgery i have never seen any tracheal surgery there are no not much of youtube videos so all i had to do was to learn and do the surgery and i had a quite a steep uh, learning curve in the first 100 cases after which as i will tell you later the results have progressively improved we all know that so far no effective artificial material has come for tracheal replacement most of the experiments have been till today a failure and it will be a great thing if somebody can find out a tracheal substitute which can replace the trachea that is why technically excellence and technical decision is very important in doing tracheal surgery we have many landmarks in history of cardiovascular and thoracic surgery in the 1930s pulmonary surgery in 40s esophageal surgery 1950s cardiac surgery 1960s tracheal surgery 1990s vats and 2000 and on 
robotic surgery has become very popular. Airway surgery, as I told you, has always been my passion. Pioneer in popularizing airway surgery was Dr. Hermes Grillo from Boston, Massachusetts. Tracheal surgery has developed late in 1960s compared to other disciplines in cardiothoracic surgery. There is a two centimeter, there used to be a two centimeter rule in trachea saying that not more than two centimeters of adult trachea can be removed. However, in 1964, Grillo showed that more than half the adult trachea can be removed by good dissection, tension free anastomosis, and release procedures. This is a picture taken in Hiroshima about maybe 20, 30, 25 years ago in, a, in a, one of the Asian meetings where I'm standing with Dr. Grillo, my wife and his wife. I had a lot of hair at that time, even though it start, started turning white like Zamir even then. Anatomy of the trachea. The trachea is a conduit between the outside world and the parenchyma of the lung. The trachea is a cartilaginous tubular structure connecting the larynx superiorly to the carina and main bronchi inferiorly. The lower edge of the cricoid cartilage defines the beginning of the trachea. On an average, the length of trachea is about 11.8 centimeters with normal ranging from 10 to 13 in males. The trachea tends to be shorter in females. The trachea is comprised of 18 to 22 D-shaped rings with anterior and lateral walls made of C-shaped cartilage. An intercartilaginous membrane connects the inferior edge of the upper cartilage to the superior edge of the cartilage below. There are approximately two rings of cartilage per centimeter of trachea, and each tracheal ring is an average of four millimeters in height. The wall of the trachea averages three millimeters in thickness. The histology of the trachea, the luminal mucosa of the trachea is lined by ciliated pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium containing mucus-producing goblet cells. The mucosa also harbors ducts that connect mucus glands in the submucosa to the surface of the tracheal lobe. Airborne irritants can temporarily or permanently damage this mucociliary escalator. Long-term cigarette smokers, for example, have increased mucal, mucus production and defective ciliary function. The trachea is a very sensitive structure. The blood supply of the trachea is segmental and as you can see, it comes from the side of the trachea and the esophagus from the tracheoesophageal group. Sir, can I ask you to just stop one second, sir? Yeah. Uh, can whoever has scribbled on their screens, can yeah. you please remove the scribbles? It's not How you, sir. Not, not you, they? sir. It's yeah. not you. It's, it's the people who are using tablets because this is a meeting. Their okay, scribble okay. is coming out. So please remove these scribbles, uh, whoever has done it. And uh, the other thing is, sir, try to speak without the microphone. It's, it, the echo is still coming, sir. Whoever is using no, iPad. Uh, there is still a bit of echo. It's okay, sir. Am I audible yes, now? Zami? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. It's okay. Don't worry. Carry on, sir. I'm sorry to disturb you. But can people please remove the scribbles? Okay, sir. Please start again. Uh, the arterial... I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. No, no problems. I mean, the arterial supply of the trachea divides into... divided into upper cervical and lower thoracic. The tracheoesophageal branches of the inferior thyroid arteries bring blood from the cervical to the cervical trachea. The thoracic trachea and carina receive blood supply from the bronchial arteries arising directly from the iota. Relationships of the trachea. The esophagus has an 
intimate relationship with the trachea along its course. The esophagus begins at the level of the cricoid cartilage and runs towards the gastroesophageal junction along the left posterior border of the trachea. The right posterior border of the trachea runs along the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. The right and left vagus nerves travel distally through the neck into a posterolateral to the corresponding common carotid arteries. The right and left recurrent laryngeal nerves are branches of the vagus nerves and function to innervate the true vocal cords. The origin of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve from the neck, it arches, it arches when it divides and courses posterior medially, just lateral to the ligamentum arteriosum. The right recurrent religion nerve branches off the right vagus distal to the right subclavian artery. The anatomy of the recurrent laryngeal nerve is very important in the surgical anatomy. This is a picture showing you the both the recurrent laryngeal nerves, the thyroid, the innominate vein, the arch of the iota, the trachea, the cricoid, and the thyroid cartilage. Surgical resection and reconstruction are considered the gold standard for treatment of tracheal stenosis. But you must all understand, but it cannot be performed in all patients. Cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurological comorbidities represent an obstacle to surgery. As not all patients with tracheal stenosis are eligible for surgical resection, Situation for bronchoscopic procedures are very useful. Well, now we come to the etiology, prolonged ventilation, especially the endotracheal tubes. We used to use the reusable red rubber tubes, which are very toxic, high pressure, low volume cuff, tracheostomy tubes, metal tracheostomy tubes, high pressure, low volume cuffs, porosis, Tromotroma and in our country, post tubercle. Tracheal stenosis can be either simple when the segment is less than one centimeter, involvement of limited mucosa, no cartilage loss, and tro no tracheomalacia. It is complex when the stenotic segment is more than one centimeter, accompanied by cartilage involvement, tracheomalacia, inflammation, scar tissue, and thickening and double stenosis. This is before the advent, when I started tracheal surgery, the CT scans were not very popular. We had to do the tracheal radiograph. The patient is positioned on the left side. On the right side, you can have a nice picture of the air tracheogram just above the metal tracheostomy tube. Now, reconstructed CT scan, is excellent, especially to show the length of the stenosis, distance from the vocal cord, distance from the carina, and presence of double stenosis. And of course, 3D reconstruction is very, very useful. Bronchoscopy in tracheal stenosis. It's usual to take measurements from the vocal cord to the top of the stricture, from the bottom of the stricture to the carina, assess inflammation, Assess tracheomalacia. In critical stenosis, never force a fi flexible fiber optic bronchoscope. A rigid bronchoscope with a central lumen is more useful. The end on view of a rigid and the flexible bronchoscope showing that the rigid bronchoscope has a larger lumen and a lumen and there is a central lumen which is not present in the fiber optic. This is one of the earlier pictures of tracheal stenosis before and after surgery. Plain x-ray chest may show an eccentric hourglass shaped tracheal narrowing in a good picture. On CT, this may be seen as an eccentric or non-concentric soft tissue appearing under tracheal cartilage. The outer tracheal wall has normal appearance and with evidence of deformity or narrowing. Dynamic expiratory image 
show little change in tracheal dimensions. Acute and chronic stenosis may also result from tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, histoplasmosis, and Wegener's granulomatosis. Congenital tracheal stenosis may be ring shaped or funnel shaped, and acquired tracheal stenosis is usually due to prior intubation or tracheostomy. Progressive dyspnea and strider is typically present. Inflammation and pressure necrosis of the true tracheal mucosa most commonly occurs either at the tracheostomy toma, stoma or at the level of the balloon, usually occurs 1.5 centimeters proximal to the tube tip. The stenosis usually is about 1.5 to 2.5 centimeters of tracheal wall. Extra thoracic trachea most often is involved. Focal narrowing may be seen if the tube tip presses on one part of the tracheal wall, usually the anterior wall. Acute post in, in intubation stenosis rec, results in edema of tracheal lumen and intraluminal granulation tissue. The treatment indication, surgical resection, good overall health status, stenotic segments from one to four centimeters, no tracheomalacia, consent to surgical treatment. Bronchoscopic stenosis, simple stenosis. Nowadays, we are able to dilate even complex stenosis. Inoperable patients due to poor overall health status and comorbidities, Serious malaria with stenotic segments less than or even more than one centimeter. Bronchoscopic methods are balloon dilatation, diathermy fulguration, and cryotherapy and stenting. Stents, a metal or plastic tube inserted into an anatomical lumen or airway passage. Tracheobronchial airway stenting is very useful for management of central airway obstruction to improve quality of life. Indication in benign disease, complex strictures more than four centimeters in length, benign stricture or stenosis in an inoperable patient, post-transplant airway stenosis, tracheobronchomalacia, Therapeutic trial before tracheoplasty, benign tracheoesophageal fistula when it is inoperable. Indications in malignant disease, malignant airway obstruction from extensive compression, endobronchial tumor with residual obstruction with multimodal thermal therapy, Mixed endobronchial and extrinsic tumor, loss of cartilage support from tumor destruction, malignant tracheoesophageal fistula for palliation. Types of stents, silicon stents, you have the straight stents, the Y stents, and the Montgomery T tube stents. This is an example of a silicon stent put in position. Common complication of silicon stents are migration, granulation tissue to some extent, though or has not as much as metallic stents, mucus plugging of the stent, and now the pulmonologists are able to fix it with a stitch so that it doesn't slip. Self-expandable metal stents is not used in benign obstructions because in the long term it can cause infection, granulum tissue formation and erosion. Types of stents are covered, non-covered, and Y stents. This is an example of one of the early cases, long, long time ago, where a metal stent has been put. This is a video of a bronchoscopic metal stent deployment done by Rajiv. The guide wire has been passed. A balloon has been passed for dilatation. The stenosis is being dilated by the balloon. 
and the metal stent has been deployed and is in position. Complications of airway stents, stent migration, stent malposition, granulation tissue, tumor ingrowth, mucoid impaction, infection, stent fracture, bronchovascular fistula, airway rupture, and allostosis or severe small foul smell of the breath. This is an example of a Montgomery T-tube in position. You can see the distal trachea and the bronchi. Now the bronchoscopy has been done. You can see the vocal cord and the stent in position. Uh, this is a 68-year-old male with papillary thyroid CA infiltrating the trachea, had tracheal resection 12 years ago, presented with recurrent infiltration and Strider required repeated fulguration to keep the airway fit. A fundamental principle of airway surgeon must always bear in mind the arteries feeding the trachea approach the tracheal wall laterally and vascularize the trachea in a segmental fashion along its longitudinal axis. The segmental arteries supplying the trachea approach the lateral tracheal wall, branch superiorly and inferiorly in a longitudinal fashion, forming an anastomosis with the segments of the arteries below and above. Segmental arrangement of blood flow limits circumferential tracheal dissection not more than two centimeters above and below, whereas anteriorly and posteriorly, it can be mobilized below up to the carina and above up to the cricol. What are the inhibitors of tracheal reconstruction? Suspicion of poor healing, presume the limits of resection, maintenance of ventilation, less incidence of cases for a single surgeon, and absence of effective processes. Anesthetic management, now we have been using the laryngeal mask for most of the cases, fulguration and dilatation, or you can use the ET tube proximal to obstruction when it's a relatively low obstruction. Tracheostomy area can be used for airway maintenance, femorofemoral bypass. Most of these, all these cases I've done with the help of my cardiac surgery colleague, Dr. Vijay Shankar. And good understanding between the anesthetist and surgeon is mandatory in getting good outcome. This is the laryngeal mask and we're connected with a sewer connector. The advantages you can see right from the vocal cord up to the carina. Preoperative assessment and planning. Careful preoperative and intraoperative assessment is very essential. CT scan and 3D reconstruction are very helpful, especially in skip lesions. Bronchoscopic assessment <coughs> is mandatory. Bronchoscopy and CT helps us to take measurements from the vocal cords to the upper end of the stricture and associated inflammation and bronchomalacia and uh, from the lower end to the stricture to the carina. We have to assess preoperative feasibility of surgery, the length of the surgery which can be resected without tension. It is better to remove less trachea initially and uh, so we have to be careful so that we have two, should not land up in two cut ends which cannot be anastomosed without tension. 
in difficult situations when there is a lot of ten tension a montgomery t tube is very handy excuse me different types of approaches the transverse cervical incision in stenosis from vocal cord to the suprasternal notch keeping sandbag under the upper chest and hyperextending the neck brings about 3 cm of mediastinal trachea to the neck it is essential to make a skin flap above and dissect it up to the thyroid cartilage anterior the strap muscles are separated in the midline and dissected laterally thyroid isthmus is cut transfixed and separated close to the trachea using bipolar diathermy to avoid injury to the recurrent radial nerves nowadays it is my practice to bronchoscopically bronchoscopically view the stenosis mark it by a needle and slowly cut the trachea and carefully separating it from the esophagus without causing injury to the esophageal mucosa and the membranous tracheal mucosa mediastinal approach for lesions up to 2 cm above the carina a sternotomy is enough for extensive tracheal resection cervico mediastinal approach is used transverse cervical and sternotomy this pro provides about 2 cm extra length of the trachea which can be resected a right thoracotomy is useful for lesions below 2 cm from the carina i prefer the right thoracotomy approach though carinal mobilization from midline sternotomy has been described and used by some surgeons tracheal mobilization i have not been happy about the superior laryngeal release and i don't do it mobilization because it interferes a lot with swallowing and increase of increases of morbidity mobilization of upper trachea is limited posteriorly to the cricothyroid junction i'll describe it later anterior and posterior mobilization of lower trachea up to the carina hilar and inferior permalary ligament release u shaped pericardial incision of pericardium around the inferior pulmonary vein this picture shows you the side view of the thyroid cartilage vocal cord arytenoid the cricoid cartilage and the posterior cricoid plate and the cricothyroid junction into which the recurrent laryngeal nerves in enter so this area you should never cut you can even cut the thyroid cartilage if necessary but never cut the cricoid thyroid junction posteriorly because you are sure to injure the recurrence which increases the morbidity of the case carinal release maneuvers you have to cut the right inferior pulmonary ligament make a u shaped incision of the pericardium starting from the anterior pericardium behind the nerve the vagus nerve below the phrenic nerve below the inferior pulmonary vein and posteriorly up to the pulmonary artery this allows the hilar structure to advance to about 3 cm here you see the inferior pulmonary ligament has been cut u shaped incision has been made in the pericardium anteriorly and posteriorly so the entire hilum is lifted up on top of it we release the hilar vessel completely so the whole right hilum becomes loose once the trachea is cut we you prefer to use a flexo metallic tracheostomy tube the yellow tube that you see into the distal trachea for cross field ventilation with sterile connections the endotracheal tube is passed from the upper end of the murphy side and it is looped with a silk suture tracheal anastomosis 
The, the sutures are held by curved and straight mosquitoes alternatively and held by an alice forceps so that the knots do not entangle. We have always preferred to use absorbable sutures, 3-0 or 2-0 sutures, coming outside in in the lower end and out inside out in the upper end so that the knots come outside. Posterior sutures are tied anterior to posterior. The distal flexometallic tube is removed and the endotracheal tube is pushed from above and passed distal. Once the anterior anastomosis area is completed, the area is flooded with saline, cuff of the endotracheal tube deflated, and the anesthetist hyperinflates to check for air leak. The neck and chest are closed with grillo stitch, put between the anterior chest wall and the chin. We keep it loose only to prevent hyperextension of the neck. Tight grillo stitch should be avoided. It is very uncomfortable and can cause spinal cord compression and quadriparesis, which is a dreaded complication which occurred in one of my early cases. Complications which we faced. In our early experience, we had a high incidence of tracheo-innominate artery fistula, seven in the first 100 cases. In the next 400 cases, we did not have a single case of this complication. This has been achieved by not skeletonizing the innominate artery and keeping the strap muscles flat between the innominate artery and tracheal anastomosis site. Best results are achieved if you can preserve the recurrent original nerve and as experience increases, the incidence of the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury becomes less and less. Post-operative complications are granulations, anastomotic separation, restenosis, vocal cord dysfunction, hemorrhage, tracheal necrosis, tracheoesophageal fistula, tracheoinominate artery system. This is an example of one of the cases of tracheoinominate artery fistula. There is a distal anastomosis between the gortex graph and the common carotid artery, and we have a prohit inhara shunt supplying the, you know, the common carotid artery. After the graft is completed, the it, it can the innominate can be ligated. This is Sashank's voice done in GH. Yeah. High tracheal stenosis in airway tuberculosis. This is a 21-year-old female patient with complete collapse of the left lung due to left main bronchus stenosis. Bronchoscopy done in 2000, January 2018 showed both tracheal and bronchial stenosis. This was done by Ravi Mehta from Bangalore. The findings were sublotic stenosis one centimeter below the vocal cord, length of two to three centimeters, tracheomalacia below the stenotic segments. Nine months later, presented with worsening symptoms, rigid bronchoscopy, balloon dilatation, and a stent was placed. Nine months later, presented with worsening strider, mandating intervention. Urgent rigid bronchoscopy was done with balloon dilatation and attempted silicon stenting. Technically not possible because the stenosis, as you will see later, is very eccentric. Completely covered metallic stent was placed. Significant malacia noted below. ATT was stopped after completing one year. This is a bronchoscopy done by Ravi Mehta. You can see the vocal cord, you can see the severe stenosis, you can see a diathermy knife which has been used to cut the stenosis. And a balloon has been used to dilate it. And long segment stenosis you can see here with an eccentric stenosis. 
the metal thread tube is thread stent is in position expandable stent good position away from the vocal cord and next one following bronchoscopy show that the metallic stent was in situ but granulation tissue occurring 30 to 40% of the distal end of the trachea being obstructed balloon dilatation of the stenotic segment was done and metallic stent removed to prevent further ingrowth of granulation tissue on 13 february 2019 patient came to our hospital with severe stenosis referred by dr ravi mehta she had to be taken for emergency surgery because of progressive stridor this is a, you can see the long segment obstruction and extrinsic bump you can see and a long obstruction you can see one obstruction and two obstruction this is a air tracheogram showing the severe obstruction this is a ct scan showing complete obstruction of the left main bronchus and complete atelectasis of the lung and severe subglottic tracheal stenosis the thyroid cartilage also has been cut you can see the flexometallic tube in position and here one comrade the tube tube is being positioned because we wanted to stent the trachea one comrade tube in position this is a pictorial representation showing the thyroid cartilage being cut anterior portion of the cricoid being cut you can see the anastomosis being started and a montgomery t tube used as a stent completed picture seen after the t tube this is a bronchoscopy showing the t tube in perfect position this is a surgical video of surgery in tracheostomy and he developed tracheal stenosis 10 days so they did a tracheal reconstruction surgery in 2011 he promptly developed restenosis balloon dilatation was done twice and later a t tube was put in july 2011 when the t tube was removed once again he developed restenosis rigid bronchoscopic tracheal dilatation and tracheal stenting using silicon stent was used in the stent they had tried to remove the stent three times however every time they removed the boy developed restenosis and inspiratory stridor yes inspiratory stridor ct scan with 3d reconstruction showing tight stenosis of the trachea in the mid segment it is about 1.3 cm length 2.6 cm from the vocal cord the anesthetist is using a laryngeal mask for intubation a transverse cervical incision is being done the skin flap is raised above up to the thyroid cartilage and the sternotomy is being done once you do a sternotomy we are able to see the entire trachea from the, the level of the thyroid cartilage to the level of the stenosis uh, you can see the exact area of stenosis there and here a finger is being passed in area to the trachea in that groove to mobilize the trachea a bronchoscope 
is passed to show the exact site of narrowing to help us decide on the site of incision. This is marked with a needle. A transverse incision is being made on the stenotic segment. It was a very, because of repeated procedure, the tracheal wall was very thick. Now the distal trachea is opened and a flexometallic tube is passed for ven ventilation. The anesthetist stops ventilating from the head end and sterile connections are passed and given to the anesthetist. Now we are trying to cut the trachea. It is so very thick that ordinary scissors were not able to cut it. Later, what we had to do was to use a bone cutter to cut the area of stenosis. Now, the trachea is separated carefully from the esophagus. Very, very carefully. This is an important step to our uh, endotracheal tube has been inserted from the mouth and the tube is delivered through the tracheal opening in the neck and through the Murphy side, a silk stitch is passed so as to pull back the tube whenever necessary. Interrupted sutures are taken in such a way the knots come outside, outside in, in the lower area and inside out in the upper trachea so that the knots come outside. The sutures are taken 4 millimeters from the cut end and 4 millimeters apart. Here you can see the, la the posterior suture, last posterior suture being taken. And once we complete the sutures, sutures are tried from anterior and po to posterior, taking care that there is no tension. At this stage, the sandbag is removed so that there is tension free ligation and ties of the trachea. The sutures are tagged carefully so that there is no confusion. Tracheosmy tube has been removed and the endotracheal tube is passed from the neck into the distal trachea. Now the anterior anastomosis, same way, is completed, taking care not to injure the underlying endotracheal tube. Here again, we tag the sutures so that there is no confusion while tying. Now the suturing has been completed and you can see the stay sutures on either side. The stay sutures are tied so that there is no tension on the anastomosis. Now we are checking for air leak. You can see the anastomosis is complete. We are putting some saline. The endotracheal tube cuff is deflated and the bag is hyperinflated to see if there is any air leak. Once after this, we close the sternum and neck and this is the grillo stitch which is put between the chin and the anterior chest wall. We don't put it very tight and make sure that there is no hyper extension possible. So we try to extubate the patient on the table unless there is a problem. And after extubation, Rajiv is doing an intraoperative bronchoscopy to see for vocal cords and the anastomotic site. of tracheal reconstruction and odontoid fracture fixation, a single stage repair.
we report a case of 22 year old girl who met with an accident in the rice mill whereas dupatta was caught in the machine and her neck was crushed ct scan showed odontoid fracture neurosurgeon tried to fix the fracture but during the procedure was abandoned because the entire endotracheal tube was lying just under the trap muscles 3d construction of the ct showed anterior tracheal wall disruption underwent surgery for odontoid fracture fixation by posterior approach followed by tracheal reconstruction in the supine position this picture shows you the anterior tracheal wall disruption endotracheal cuff covered by strap muscles of the neck the you can see the over inflated endotracheal tube cuff per intraoperative finding the over inflated endotracheal tube cuff with the anterior tracheal wall has sloughed off with only strap muscles present anteriorly thyroid isthmus was cut and divided between sutures cross field ventilation with flexometallic tube intraoperative ventilation managed by flexometallic tube to distal trachea tracheal margins were identified separated and repaired odontoid fracture fixation tracheal injury associated with odontoid fracture is very rare bronchoscopic guided intubation is very essential to avoid hyperextension of the neck and causing more injury to the spinal cord during anesthetic induction 3d reconstruction is very helpful for planning operative strategy balloon dilatation in acute tracheal stenosis this was a 62 year old female with severe copd came with severe inspiratory strider at rest found to have severe tracheal stenosis evaluated thoroughly with pft breathing breath holding time abg considered not fit of fit for surgery plan for tracheal balloon dilatation under cardiopulmonary bypass standby this is a severe stenosis you here in this other next ct also you can show see the thickening and the stenosis this is a bronchoscopic picture showing you the long segment stenosis A balloon has been passed and balloon dilatation has been done and the bronchoscopy could be, hope could be easily passed beyond and she had done well. Extubated on the table, shifted to recovery, no strider, discharge in a stable condition. Tracheal resection in a child. This is a three-year-old child from Nigeria. Father was a pediatrician, came with road traffic accidents in May 2019. CPR was done by the father at the site and then shifted to the hospital and intubated in Nigeria. Unable to wean off the ventilator, so tracheostomy tube was done. Unable to withstand tracheostomy and tube removed. In July 2019, found to have tracheal stenosis, for which plan to take the child to USA, but couldn't get visa clearance. Brought to Apollo Hospital in January 2020 for further management. The tracheal stenosis was just proximal to the tracheostomy tube. Measurements, total length of trachea 6.8 cm, stenosis 1 cm, vocal cord to proximal part of stenosis 2.3 centimeters distal point uh, to the uh, point to the, uh, the distal point to this of the stenosis to carina 4.5 centimeters. You can see the pre-operative laryngoscopy showing you the vocal cord moving and a segment of good trachea just below the vocal cord, and the uh, which we thought was adequate for it there. This is the tracheostomy tube in position, the tracheal thickened trachea being removed. You can see the gross thickening and narrowing of the trachea and uh, distal trachea ventilated by a endotracheal flexometallic tube. This is after repair showing you good vocal cord function.
Side was extubated, shifted to recovery. Clear, the voice was clear and intact. Discharged on fourth post post op day, and uh, it just showed an uh, histopathology showed chronic inflammation. Case of acute acquired tracheal stenosis and tracheoesophageal fistula. 18 month old male ingested a button battery seven months ago, removed from the esophagus within four hours. Mucosal erosion notice, aspiration not, not, no, no, noted 10 days later, and so a rail tube was passed. Uh, bronchoscopy was done and TE fistula confirmed. Commons nutrition support with nasogastric feed, jejunostomy, and nasoduodenal feeds. Other, uh, other milestones were normal. This is the button battery in situ, which was removed. Healthy looking stripe, child, moderate strider, nil pallor, ictress, dehydration, cyanosis, or clubbing. Nasogastric tube in situ. The x ray showed good air entry, crepitations in the right side with inspiratory V's. This is the large tracheoesophageal fistula and the tracheal lumen, which is seen. The bronchoscope can be easily passed into the esophagus and the esophagoscope could be passed into the trachea. This is the x-ray chest of the patient. Large defect, 5 millimeters wide in the la right lateral aspect of the esophagus, communicating with the trachea for about 2.5 centimeters above the carina. Bilateral, multiple uh, parenchymal nodules were seen. Showing the large tracheoesophageal fistula. Intraoperative bronchoscopy was done under GA with a laryngeal mask. And then you can see the bronchoscope, anterior cervical collar incision, division of strap muscles, thyroid and isthmus, mobilization and division of trachea, identification and repair of both esophagus and tracheal fistula, uh, and airway checked, hemostasis secured and wound closed. This is a picture showing the opening in the trachea and the fistula. You can see the uh, Flexometallic tube distally, the trachea, tracheal opening of the fistula to the left, and the alice is holding the opening in the esophagus. That is the esophageal opening. The mucous membrane has to be included in each stitch. You have to cut the trachea and go in to have proper exposure and separate the trachea and esophagus carefully without injury and then do the anastomosis. The child is being extubated. The child was discharged in the third post-operative day and the nasogastric tube was removed. This is the last case, 11 month old infant from Oman, strider from the neonatal period with recurrent uh, lung infections, diagnosed to have a VSD and was scheduled to have repair in Oman a month ago. This was, there, there was difficulty in intubation at induction of anesthesia and surgery was abandoned. CT done afterwards showed severe tracheal stenosis, hence referred for airway reconstruction surgery, has been on endotracheal tube and ventilatory support uh, right from that time. And uh, 
This is a critically ill patient with Down syndrome and uh, with a VSD. This was done. Dr. Neville closed the VSD and on cardiopulmonary bypass, came out bypass, CT chest, echo, bronchoscopy, and other investigations. This is the X-ray of the patient, say showing pneumonia. The CT of the patient showing you the tracheal narrowing. This is the operative picture. The trachea has been taped with a tape. And now you can see a knife being used to cut the trachea. Umbilical tape has been used. Measurements of the trachea are taken. And trachea has been cut. In this child, one centimeter of the trachea is a long segment, etc. Complete ring of the trachea, not a funnel shape narrowing. In to end anastomosis is done, extubated, next flexed, chest x ray, physiotherapy, and ambulation. So I have compl completed my presentation. Thank you very much for all of you for patiently hearing. And uh, I would like to take uh, any questions from you. Zamir, are you there? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Uh, hello? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, hi, you're there. Okay. So I'll start uh, taking some questions, sir, uh, if that's okay with you. Sure. Uh, are, you, are you okay for a few more uh, minutes, sir, to take some yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Oh, I'm okay. Sir. Okay. So one of the first basic questions that uh, one of our postgraduates is asking is uh, what is the maximum length of trachea that can be resected? See, in an adult male with a long neck, about five centimeters, that is half the trachea can be resected. Whereas in a short, stout female, the length of the trachea that can be excised becomes progressively less. So it depends essentially on the build height and the Okay. Now, in what conditions of tracheal surgery do you decide to use cardiopulmonary bypass? When I feel that the patient during intubation can collapse, can he may have difficulty in intubation and may develop hypoxia and arrest. Because <coughs> those patients who develop arrest, you can never do anything about them. Such cases, I always keep cardiopulmonary bypass standby. The, uh, we give a spinal anesthesia, expose the femoral vessels, open the oxygenator and keep it. Dr. Vijay Shankar is ready. In difficult cases, we even put the cannula and keep it ready. And if necessary, the an uh, anesthetist tries to intubate. If he intubates, we don't go on bypass. Otherwise, in uh, at least in four or five situations, we had to go on by this. And because you have hypoxia and arrest on the table in an ill patient, that is it. You can't get the patient out. And your bypass is femoral femoral, right? Femoral femoral, yes. Okay, and that, that gives you good uh, circulatory support for the patient. Yes. Okay. Have you ever had an arrest on table? Yes, I have. And, had, do do in and luckily, the arrest occurred by the time I had exposed the trachea and I was able to immediately, within one minute, intubate the distal trachea. One patient arrested, this was one of my early cases, that was one instance which arrested, I couldn't revive. And another patient who pulled off the tracheostomy tube before surgery in the hospital, when we are planning surgery, I couldn't intubate, he developed hypoxia and arrest. These are the two cases which I could not revive. One case I could revive. Because once they arrest, if you're not quick, if you're not able to ventilate, you can never get them. I see. So, so this is mentioned to the patient uh, in the consent forms and also the risk of a permanent yes. tracheostomy. Yes. See, in ill patients, we give them a higher risk on the table. For example, one of the patients I remember came in severe strider. I was reluctant. But Rajiv said, we'll give him a try. So did a bronchoscopy, quickly put a balloon and dilated, they're able to get away. So we always tell them that a chance of risk to life is there. 
and in very sick patients, we give more than 50% risk uh, before we take them up so that they know the gravity of the situation. It's very, very essential nowadays to talk everything to the patient before you take them up for sale. When you do tracheal surgery and you dissect around the trachea, what energy device do you use? Bipolar cartilage and sharp scissors. Unipolar is more dangerous to the retina. Okay. Uh, any any role for harmonic or something like that in that area? Uh, I'm not used harmonic, uh, uh, Zamir. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm sure it should be a good. It can be used. Where well, Rajiv uses a lot of harmonic in the uh, in his wax, unipotal wax, but I'm not tried it. I must read about it and see whether it is superior. See, uh, I mean, what has happened is over the years, our incidence of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury has come down. So we are happy with the technique that we are following: sharp dissection and bipolar. So, do you actually try to identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve or do you leave it alone? I leave it alone. You leave it alone. Don't chase it and identify it. See it well and good. Otherwise, I don't look for it. I don't look for it. Okay. So, there is less chance of injury because that's one of the philosophies, isn't it? That if you don't go looking for it, you won't damage it. What, what sutures do you use for your tracheal uh, anastomosis? We use absorbable uh, vical. Some people use monocle. I've been used, very used to vical. Two depends upon the thickness. Sometimes one zero, two zero, three zero, and small children force. And, and just for the youngsters, what is the difference between using a continuous suture versus interrupted yeah. suture? See, when the tracheal wall or the bronchial wall is very thick and diseased, it is better to use a interrupted suture. But when you have good tracheal wall and uh, it is healthy and not inflamed, not grossly thickened, you can as well use a continuous suture. Two, two rays of continuous, not one suture all around, one anteriorly, one posteriorly. It depends upon the how the trachea is. Like the, the trachea was very thickened, so there was no way we could use a continuous. And what are your indications for using a muscle flap on See, muscle anastomosis? flap, one thing for sure, when you think the innominate artery is straddling on the anastomosis, I use a muscle flap. And the tracheoesophageal fistula there, I use the muscle flap. I don't use a muscle flap in any other situation. Tracheoesophageal fistula repair also, if I'm not happy, I use it, not as a routine. But innominate artery close to the suture, I always use a muscle flap. It is usually the strap muscles. And, and in a few of your cases, uh, the stricture was very close to the vocal cords. And yep. uh, I saw that you also put in a stent, or maybe the yep. pulmonologist put in a stent. Yeah. So, what is the safe distance of a landing zone of a Normally, stand below the, the rest distance? It should be for a good repair, 1.5 centimeters of the below the vocal cord, 1.5. But even for stenosis higher, you can cut thyroid cartilage up to the vocal cord. You can, but posteriorly you should not cut the cricoid. Anteriorly, the cricoid can be cut. And if you have any problem, you make a uh, oblique incision of the trachea above and below. If there is, you know, in very high laryngeal laryngotracheal stenosis, it is always better to put a stent, Montgomery T tube stent, for some time, which can be removed at a later date. So that is an indi one of the indications for a Montgomery T tube stent. And when you keep a T tube stent. The vertical limb should be below the vocal cords as far as possible. If you try to put it above, patient will aspirate. And do you need to do anything to the vocal cords, like inject them with silicone and things? No, like that? I've never used it, uh, uh, Zamir. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not had the necessity to use it. Okay. What is the risk of recurrence with balloon dilatation? The recurrence of balloon dilatation is fairly high. But the only thing is, you in ill patients, you can do it again and again and again. When they are poor, surgery, some of them do not want surgery. Some of them are very high risk for surgery. 
Balloon dilatation in benign stenosis is reserved for these two categories of patients. And the advantage of balloon is you can do it again and again, but in case you fail, and you can explain to the patient and take them up for surgery later. Because by the time they are fed up, they want a permanent answer. And, and this dilator is specific for the trachea, or is it yes, the same specific for trachea. You have different dilators for trachea, different for esophagus. So you have different. They are not interchangeable. No, you you can use the esophageal balloon if you don't have for a tracheal balloon, but not a tracheal balloon for the esophagus. All right. And when you do such tracheal surgery in pediatrics, uh, what is the effect of uh, growth on the on the anastomosis that you have made? Does it matter? See, Does it depend yeah, on it? it really. I mean, it is a very good question. In children and small infants, it better to never use continuous suture. Because once you use continuous suture, you are ca causing a fixed obstruction. Whereas when you use an interrupted suture, there is enough normal trachea in between to grow. Anyway, we have to follow follow these patients up. And I have had not many, I've not had on too many children and infants. I've not had any problem so far. One patient had a problem, but it was only granulation tissue. Once we pulled it out, the child became all right. Uh, all right. And the tracheoesophageal fistula that you operated, uh, the case that you showed, yeah. what do you do to the esophagus? Do you do you bypass the esophagus uh, to allow it to heal? Or no, you, 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 cut, you cut the esophagus. There is a vertical hole in the esophagus. Oh. The right tube is already there. So make sure that you don't narrow the esophagus. Lift it up and I use continuous suture for the esophagus. And uh, you, yeah. And that feels very well. And interrupted sutures as well. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, some youngsters are asking some questions, sir. Uh, uh, how do you decide that trachomalacia is present? You have to do it by bronchoscopy. When you do bronchoscopy, when there is significant trachomalacia, the anterior and posterior walls which will come very close to each other. And when during inspiration and expiration, if it remains, you have to do something about it. And is trachomalacia irreversible? Trachomalacia, after surgery, what happens is after surgery, when you make the trachea more taut, most of the cases, the trachomalacia disappears because you're pulling the trachea from both ends and suturing it. So it becomes more taut and the trachomalacia problem does not arise. It gets cleared. I've not had a recurrent trachomalacia after surgery. Sir, so there is a question. Uh, they've asked you to please re explain intubation for tracheal surgery. They just want clarity on that. Yeah. See, what we do is we use a laryngeal mask. I showed it on the video. Yeah. And then we put a laryngeal mask and connect it to a ventilator, then put a bronchoscope and assess it and see if everything is all right. The anesthetist sees for carbon dioxide retention, whether he's able to blow the lung. And I have not had a problem in so far to replace the laryngeal mask. Last three years, we have been laryngeal, using the laryngeal mask in each and every one of our cases. It is excellent. Even for patients with carbon dioxide resection, you put a laryngeal mask, like that lady I showed you, you dilate the trachea, the carbon dioxide resection retention goes away. And difficult situations, you can dilate and then operate. We have to have the entire gamut, the rigid bronchoscope, the flexible bronchoscope, video bronchoscope, dilators, cryo, diathermy, the whole set has to be available. You cannot be running at that time, cardiopulmonary process. For safety, you have to have the, go have the entire gamut and decide what is best for the patient. Sure. Now, when you use stents in patients, um, how do they cope with foreign body sensation and resultant cough. Sorry, I didn't get you. Yeah, he's asking when yeah. you use stents in yeah. the trachea, yeah. how do you cope? How do the patient cope with a foreign body sensation? They and always have a foreign body sensation, especially in expandable metal stents. In the silicon stents, it is less. They always get infected. They always have halistosis. 
especially in the expandable stents. And granulation tissue is much more common in expandable stents, as you know, migration, erosion, granulation tissue, structure is than a silicon stent. The, what the pulmonologists do is they put the stent, keep the stent for some time, they put a stitch to fix the stent through them, viewing it through the bronchoscope, and they invariably remove it after some time. Some of them, that is enough. Some of them need surgery after that, like this boy who had multiple procedures and needed surgery. And, and when you're doing a bronchial sleeve, this is slightly different question. Yeah, yeah. But they're asking, how do you manage mismatch of uh, luminal diameter? See, uh, like mismatch anyway, anywhere, like the vascular and things like that. The area which is larger, you have to the interest, the sutures have to be a little more apart. The area which is narrower, the sutures have to be close. You can't. Uh, uh, it has to be adjusted all around and not in the last stitch. In that case, you get a dog earring and stimulus. So when you do that, you can adjust the anastomosis. So the same question they're saying is like in bowel anastomosis, you look for vascularity by bleeding, color, and pulsation. How do you identify the patterns or LV? See, when you look at the trachea and the bronchus, you know that the trachea or the bronchus is viable by the appearance. The necrotic trachea or bronchus is dark in color and it is necrotic. It has thick blocks and granulation tissue. When you do airway surgery, you'll be very easily able to see it and identify it by the yeah. naked eye. Yeah. And the bronchoscope also helps you to take measurements and look at it even when you're operating. Uh, the next question they're asking is, what should be the surgery for pre-cord stenosis and stenosis close to vocal cords? That is what I was telling you. Cricoid stenosis, you have to cut the cri you can cut the cricoid only anteriorly, but you can cut the thyroid cartilage much more. You can cut, make an oblique incision on the trachea, preserving the tracheoesophageal groove posteriorly and taking out some portion of the tracheal cartilage, make a lip of the lower trachea, the white V-shaped lip like this, take it up and anastomosis. Only thing is, you must not go beyond the tip of the vocal cord, that's the tip of the thyroid cartilage, because that is where the vocal cord is attached. Sure. And, and when you have done, I am presuming this question is about tracheoesophageal surgery. Uh, when do you start oral feeds after surgery? Uh, once the vocal cord is good, you can start it the next, next morning. Next morning. Next morning. And, and what is the role for bronchoscopic? You give him what bron to do. You, bronchoscopic assessment is done intraoperatively after surgery and if necessary only, if there is, if you anticipate vocal cord problem, you can do it on the first post-operative day to see for vocal cord movement, to see for granulation tissue, to see the viability of your anastomosis. I usually do not do it as a routine unless it is necessary. I don't like to irritate the bronchial anastomosis. I see. And, and there's again, I think this is a question you've already answered, but I'll ask you, they're asking about bronchoscopic dilatation for stenosis. Is there any role? For, for, for bronchial stenosis? Definitely yeah, there is a role. Yes, you have so many tubercular patients who come who have bad disease, who have localized stenosis for a little long, you always try to dilate them first. See how they react and don't jump into surgery without giving him a trial of balloon dilatation. If they get away with balloon dilatation, you well and good. If they don't, we can always offer surgery later. And is it mandatory to use CPD in small children? Cardiopulmonary bypass. Yeah. No, no, definitely. I'm not I never used the one, one case they used was VSD. They finished the VSD, they took, came off bypass, and I ventilated with a tracheostomy tube, endotracheal tube, and I mean, it does, did the tracheal surgery. Now, I've never used uh, CP bypass in for children, but in congenital tracheal stenosis, world over, 
in the long sigma where they do slight tracheoplasty, they do use uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. I have not had the opportunity. Mine was a ring stenosis, as I showed, showed you. Sure. And, and uh, have you had any experience with post-transplant uh, uh, stenosis? Uh, see, the transplant is done by a different group of surgeons. I don't get involved with them. They use some the pulmonologist. Uh, I'm not able to answer that question because I have no experience in post-transplant dilatation of stitches. Uh, this question is, uh, he's saying, if intermediate stem bronchus is damaged with loss of tracheal tissue, not approximated by hilar mobilization, uh, do you do a pneumonectomy? See, unless you are forced to do a pneumonectomy, never do do a pneumonectomy. Preoperatively, you will be able to assess it with a good quality CT and bronchoscope. And always you warn the patient that if necessary, there is a chance that may be land up. I have not had to do a pneumonectomy on a patient because we have studied it thoroughly by CT scan, bronchoscopy, good quality CT scans, looking at the bronchial mucosa, and then uh, looking at the CT scans along with a good radiologist. They give us more information. So, uh, you, you may land up. One case I had of a trauma patient who had tracheobronchial disruption. That patient had a loss of bronchial tissue in the bronchus intermediates. Upper lobe could be saved, but the up, upper lobe could be saved, but the upper lobe cut into the bronchus could not be anastomosed. There was no tissue distally because it was completely disrupted. That patient on normal breathing had a large air leak to the IC. Okay. Um, you in situations for pneumonectomy. Yeah. But by sure. large, try to avoid it. Sure, of course. And, and uh, do you do slide tracheoplasty? I have done one case. I have done one case along with Dr. Neville. A slight tracheoplasty. Yeah, but, but it's a different ball game. It is done by it, uh, centers all over the world who are, who are completely concentrating on this. In fact, this child from Oman, they wanted to take the child to Great Oman Street, but uh, the government did not permit them to go because of the expenses. I spoke they, a guy from Great Oman Street. I, forget his name, is an Indian guy, he spoke to me and said, why don't you do this? And that's why we did it. He, there are, but slight tracheoplasty in an infant is an entirely different ball game. You need to have dedicated team of doctors, pulmonologists, anesthetists, and surgeons to that. I've done just two cases. And uh, my experience in this, that we had to do it because there was nobody else doing it in this country. So that, I, I feel if, if somebody can afford it, nothing like going to a center uh, in the US or UK, which are not specific for this purpose. Can we do that in adults? So, no, no. Predominantly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, uh, next question is tracheoinominate fistula in long standing tracheostomy tubes. Uh, I've, I've done a few cases like that. Just two cases, sure. along with Vijay Shankar. But nowadays, you have covered stents. Yeah. So the role of surgery has drastically come down. Whenever you suspect something, what you need is take the patient to the cat lab, put a covered stent and be done. Because this surgery is difficult surgery. Already the patient is in tracheostomy. Nowadays, we send it to the invasive radiologist for stenting. Okay, so how do you buy time when the first bleed happens? When the first bleed up occurs, you can never buy time. The first case that we had was a case for which I did a tracheal resection and re and anastomosis, mucoepidermoid carcinoma. It was a Sunday evening at five o'clock. My friend Vijay Shankar is always available. Luckily, I was also available on that day. We did a CT scan, which showed the tracheo artery area fistula. 
So immediately, see, initially there will be red, bright red blood. If you give time, it is a surgical emergency. You have to do it as soon as possible if you have to have good results. You cannot breathe, sleep and do it next morning. In an adenoid cystic carcinoma, yeah. if, if your resection is R2 or R1, is it yeah. safe to reset trachea and follow it with radiotherapy? Why not? This usually, invariably, they are large tumors causing obstruction. So we know that they can recur. When they recur, we can always palliate them, fulgrate them, and look after them. But if you leave a big tumor causing complete an obstruction of the trachea or bronchi for the matter, the patient will progressively become more dyspneic and die. So you can do surgery and follow it up with palliative medicine. And, and what are the strategies in subglottic stenosis in children? Uh, I've not had the opportunity to do subglottic, the same principle. You know, they usually have a laryngotracheal uh, course in, were conducted by Walter Klepetko in Vienna. I, Rajiv and I have attended three of their meetings. This meeting we could not go because of the coronavirus. So they have a dedicated team. I'm sure you would have been to Vienna, to Klepetko's place. Yes. They have a dedicated team of pediatric let, uh, let, uh, ENT surgeons and pediatric thoracic surgeons who do it together, do it together. And uh, of course, the same principle holds good. I usually, when it is an infant and a child, I involve an ENT surgeon as well, because most of them go to them and they involve you. It is like that. One Dr. Balaji, who has done all the cases with me from me. And I also, at this point of time, want to thank all my anesthetists, Dr. Baskar, Dr. Naidu, Dr. Janigaram, um, and uh, um, who had helped me throughout my career, and Dr. Satya now. It is a big uh, team game. And the assistants, the associates, Dr. Sashank has been there from the first case till the time I, in 2005. And now, of course, Roy Nanamuth was there, now Rajiv is there. You need a good team. As you get older, you can do only a little time in the operation theater. After that, you start getting. So you have, once you have a good team with you, you go, can go on for a much longer time, provided God gives you good eyes and good hands. So that's what I feel. For older surgeons to hand over the modern things to the younger surgeons. They are much better than you that way. You don't try to learn. I tried to learn back surgery. I knew that once Rajiv started moving, he was much faster and better. And of course, Zamir was there always to, uh, telling me to keep away, you know, in that aspect. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's important. It is difficult for the surgeon to give away what he gets to the next person. Being a son, it is very easy for me. But <laughs> others, it becomes even more difficult. But you have to do it if you have to prove this. Very important, sir. Very good point. Sir, uh, can pericardium be used to cover loss of trachea? Uh, pericardium, the problem in pericardium is if it is less than one centimeter, half a centimeter, you can patch it. But if you have a large circumference of trachea, if you put a pericardium, it will flap. Even though you glutarily um, put glutarily, still it is not as thick. It has not got the thickness. So during inspiration, it will go in. And later, it will get, at the site of anastomosis, you can still get granulation. Tracheal surgery, you have to use God-given trachea as far as possible. Whatever else you can try to use, because they always have limitations. And do you consider neck radiation a contraindication to tracheal surgery? Neck irradiation can cause severe thickening of the trachea, like the case you said, and loss of tissue plane. So it makes tracheal surgery definitely more uh, difficult, like redo lung surgery after radiation. There is no plane between the vessels and the trachea. We have all seen that. The same point holds good in the trachea as well. And is there a specific age to operate in congenital tracheal stenosis? 
congenital tracheal stenosis as early as they become uh, symptomatic and they have difficulty in breathing, you have to do it. You have to do it. And as I told you, there are dedicated centers to do it. The, the infant cases I've done with the pediatric cardiac surgeon, Dr. Neville in Apollo. So we need a team even for that. I'll, I'll ask the last question, sir. Uh, it's from a young surgeon who is saying, if we are stuck in a place where there is no backup, how do we go about surgery for tracheal innominate fistula? Could you please... Just put a stent and be done away. The best thing is to put a stent. If you're not able to put a stent, you have to do the surgery. You have to get the ascending aorta. You have to get the distal innominate artery, tape it, make a shunt between the, you know, have a temporary shunt, the Prohit Inara shunt, or two Foley's catheter and connect it, which I've done in the GH, and then you do the anastomosis and tie the innominator. That's the only thing you have to do it, because if you don't do it, the patient is definitely going to die. You have to explain the risk, tell the relatives, and go on. And how close are we to a tracheal prosthesis? So far, uh, the all the three meetings I've been there, very bad results. Uh, they've been, uh, I was looking forward to the new meeting to see if anything new has come. They've tried all sorts of things, you know. They have uh, tried a lot of things, uh, homographs. They have tried uh, skin flaps with cartilage in between, was trying to vascularize it, but all of them have been a failure so so that was a very, very interesting and very informative session, sir. Uh, I, I have covered all the questions from the audience. Thank you very much uh, for your time, sir. It's been an honor to, uh, to have uh, moderated this session with you. And I have to say, I don't know about the juniors, but I learned a lot for sure. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, please keep safe. And uh, we'll keep in touch. Uh, hopefully, uh, we should meet up uh, soon, sir.